All right, everyone. So today's lecture is going to be on pulmonary function testing and acid-base interpretation. And this is going to be a very basic approach to the two uh, interpretations. And the reason being is we really just want to be able to answer questions on the test and, of course, know a little bit about it. If you go into the field where you'll be doing this on a regular basis, you'll, of course, know a whole lot more than what I'm able to teach in a short period of time. Uh, I like to keep it basic because in the past I have gone more into depth and I find that when students are kind of overwhelmed with all the extra details, they kind of miss the main point that I would prefer you get the main point and leave out some of the details, then flood you with details and you miss the main point. So we're going to be going step by step. I'm going to try my best to make it as simple as possible so that you can get all of these questions right on my test. Now. Also in the past, I've done this pulmonary function testing and acid base lecture towards the beginning, kind of when I do my introduction lecture. But historically, I've found that students do better learning this when they have some sort of base. So you've probably covered uh, flow uh, volumes and things in patho already which is a nice foundation. And we've already gotten our obstructive lecture under our belts. We're about to do our, our restrictive lecture. So we've got some basis so that these numbers mean something to us. And I think that's really important. And that's why I wait a little bit, or I, this year I decided to wait a little bit to introduce these concepts to you. First, we're going to do PFT interpretation. And we're going to try to do it step by step. There are a lot of algorithms and kind of uh, ways, step processes that, that are online. And what I've done is I've kind of taken uh, AAFP's version and I've taken UpToDate's version and I've taken how students learn and I've tried to simplify it and kind of create my own version of how to interpret. If you have your own way of doing it and you understand it, feel free to do it your way. This is just a suggestion. It's a way that I approach it and trying to keep it as simple as possible. I know that PFTs are more complicated than what I'm going to teach you, but hopefully we can get this and then we can add the details on later when we need to. So my PFT interpretation includes an algorithmic approach, meaning we're going to be simple and stepwise. And you have to, before you start this, you have to understand lung volumes, you have to understand some respiratory physiology before you try to do this, or else you're really just memorizing steps and numbers, and it's not going to make sense. When something makes sense, it's a lot easier to put it in your brain and recall it later when you need it. And I also recommend you practice. Do practice questions on PFT interpretation. It will help you know that you know what you're talking about and that you can reproduce it when you need it. This is a simple lung volumes and capacities chart. Uh, lung volumes, I'm sure we've learned in patho. I'm not going to spend time teaching you that here, but you should know basic lung volume terminology and capacity terminology. Okay. Now you'll notice that lung volumes are single items, whereas capacities are multiple items put together. That's about the basics I'm going to cover for this lecture. That the these lung volumes are meant for another lecture. Okay. So what are PFTs? PFTs are a group of tests that help give us something objective to tie to our clinical findings. And we order PFTs when we have a suspicion that there's something going on and we want to pinpoint exactly what type of process it is that's happening in our patient. And it, you have to interpret these PFTs in context, right? They're not just arbitrary numbers thrown at you. You take a patient history, you do the physical examination, and you look at their patterns and you combine, combine that all together, and that helps you uh, solidify your diagnosis. And remember, we use these outpatient for the most part. We don't do these in emergency situations. We, we do them when, when we're looking for evidence of respiratory disease. Uh, we also do it to kind of assess progression. So we get baseline PFTs when we make a diagnosis or help us make a diagnosis. And then we can compare, you know, what, what, how have these PFTs changed a year from now, two years from now. Uh, we can also monitor treatments. We can kind of evaluate patients' lung capacities preoperatively or pre-procedure. And we can also look at side effects of lung, of medications and such. 
And the components include lung volumes, which you just saw a chart on, spirometry, which is mainly what we're going to be looking at here, and then diffusing capacity as well. When a patient goes in to have PFTs done, before we can even start the process, we have to put in or input into our computers, we have to input certain pr predicted factors because a 20-year-old tall, thin male versus a 60-year-old short, chunky female, they're going to have two completely different predictive values. The tall, lean, young male is going to have much better bigger capacities, their lungs can fit a lot more air than an elderly woman. And so these factors help us create those predicted values. It include age, gender, height, and whether a patient smokes or not. And all this is input into the computer when the patient goes in to have these function tests done. And the blanket term PFTs or pulmonary function tests is done typically by two methods. The first is spirometry. Spirometry is easy to do. A lot of primary care offices have spirometers. They're hooked up to a computer. You put a mouthpiece on it and they also, not just a computer, they can have little hand, kind of handheld devices that can do this as well. And you have the patient breathe out as hard as he can and then breathe in. And we can take the results from that. Now the plasmography, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, is, is a more specialized uh, test that you do inside an airtight box, which also kind of adds some other components to your testing, can kind of compare the pressures in your lungs and things to atmospheric pressure, it kind of, kind of has a more controlled environment. And I included a video here, I'm not going to play it for us for this panopto, but it kind of shows you the apparatus, how patients would sit for a PFT, just so you have kind of in your brain, like, what is this exactly? It's not just numbers, right? It's, it's a patient sitting there doing the breathing and we're getting results, okay? So some terminology, like I mentioned before, you have to know your flow loop volumes. And we also have to know some special terminology and what they mean. FEV1 is important. Uh, it's going to be the amount of air we can blow out in one second. Okay, We expect to see decreased FEV1s in obstructive type processes. Okay, uh, F FVC is the total amount of air that a patient is able to breathe out. Now an FEV1 to FVC ratio, as we'll find, is the very, very, very first thing that we look at after the history and physical exam to help us determine whether uh, something is restrictive, obstructive, or normal, okay? Uh, I kind of bypassed these other ones. They're not quite as important. We're going to stick to the basics here. The DLCO, or diffusing capacity, uh, it is for carbon monoxide, but overall what it really means is how much oxygen and carbon dioxide can we diffuse. So when we tend to see a DLCO, it means something different in a restrictive pattern versus an obstructive pattern. Uh, and we'll go into that a little bit more as we go through the algorithm. But DLCO is the diffusing capacity. Last but not least on here, I want to talk about the TLC or the total lung capacity. And this is the total amount of air that the lungs can fit in maximum inflation. Okay, so this will be an important determining factor for restrictive disease and also for air trapping and hyperinflation on obstructive disease. All right, so this is my algorithm. It kind of looks a little scary when you first look at it, but I essentially took a few different uh, approaches from online and put it together to try to keep it nice and simple so we can go step by step and assess it, okay? And I have kind of a step by step process where we will kind of highlight things and move through it. Here's my eight step process. Sometimes you do all these steps Sometimes you don't. There are a few steps that tend to be left out from time to time. But essentially, this is the process that I take to assessing a PFT. First step, I'm going to examine the FEV1 to FVC ratio. That is in every single case. The first thing I do is examine the FEV1 to FVC ratio. Okay. If the FEV1 to FVC ratio is less than 70% predicted, we will have an obstructive process. You have to remember this, have to, have to, have to. If you have an FEV1 to FVC ratio less than 
it is likely an obstructive process. All right, hopefully we got that part down. Now let's go to this other side here. If the FAV1 to FAC ratio is greater than 70%, we will either have a restrictive process or a normal, right? Because greater than 70% can also be normal. All right, so that's the first step in the process. I hope we got that. If we got it, good. Step two, we're going to look at the TLC, which is the total lung capacity, which is the total amount of air we can fit in our lungs at maximum inspiration. Okay. Now, on the obstructive side here, when we look at the TLC, oftentimes the TLC will be normal. Okay. In advanced disease, such as COPD, and sometimes in an acute asthma exacerbation, we will actually see an increase in the total lung capacity. And the increase in total lung capacity is due to the hyperinflation. Think of the barrel chest, right? Think of the air that gets trapped in there over time, hyperinflates the lungs. And I have a little chart down here that helps us differentiate between the different TLCs. So greater than 120% is going to be hyperinflation. Anything from about 80% to about 100% is gonna be normal. And then when we get over here to this side and we look at the total lung capacity, we think about restrictive processes and restrictive processes do not allow air into the lungs. So you can imagine that the amount of air that the lungs can hold at maximum inspiration, the TLC will be decreased in a restrictive process. And as you can see here, there are degrees of restriction. There's mild, moderate, moderately severe, and severe based on the the number of the TLC, the less that the lungs can hold, the lower the TLC, the more severe restriction is going on, okay? Now, if the TLC is greater than 80% and the FEV1 to FEC ratio is normal, then we likely have a normal patient. Now, it's not often that we order a PFT that we get normal results because usually there's some sort of history that's making you order it. So we will see a little later on that there are some other things we can do to, to truly assess whether something is normal or not. All right, you got TLC? If you don't, go back and read a little more and then move on. Step three. Step three, we're going to look at the DLCO. And remember we said DLCO is the diffusing capacity, right? Diffusing capacity, how much oxygen can exchange at the level of the capillaries and how much CO2 can be exchanged, okay? Remember when we talked about, um, let's see, emphysema, right? We said emphysema was a parenchymal disease, right? The destruction of tissue, coalescing, of the alveoli, so we get decreased surface area. Remember decreased surface area? Remember we had a tennis court's worth of a surface area for diffusing? And then with emphysema, we cut that down. So DLCO in an obstructive process on this side of the algorithm, DLCO is going to tell us whether there is tissue destruction or not. And so you'll see that if you have a DLCO less than 80%, it's likely emphysema because that that indicates tissue destruction, okay? If we see a DLCO that's greater than 80%, we're thinking probably more chronic bronchitis, okay? Very good. If we see a DLCO that's also normal in asthma, that is more than likely what we will see because it does, as, asthma is an airway disease, not a tissue disease. And so we should see a normal DLCO in asthma as well. Just like we had kind of percentage, percentage uh, mild, moderate, severe over here in the TLC. We also have it for the DLCO. And you'll see that mild is 60 to 80%, moderate 40 to 60, and severe is less than 40%. So that's the DLCO on the obstructive side. Now, on the restrictive side over here, DLCO means something a little bit different. When we talked about restrictive lung disease, we said that when we look at restriction from a bird's eye perspective, it can either be due to things outside of the lung or extra pulmonary things, or it can be due to things within the lung like interstitial lung disease or the pneumoconiosis. Those are problems with the lung itself. But we said as far as extra pulmonary, it could be neuromuscular issues. It could be things like kyphoscoliosis, things outside of the lungs that restrict air from going into them. So the DLCO on the restrictive side tells you 
if it is related to the lungs or related to something other than the lungs. Okay, so we see here, if the DLCO is less than 80%, that means that it is a restriction due to the lungs itself, either a parenchymal issue or a pulmonary vascular issue. If the DLCO is greater than 80%, that means it's coming from somewhere outside of the lungs, like a kyphoscoliosis. Hopefully that makes sense. We know that DLCO means two different things on each side of this algorithm, and hopefully we understand the difference. All right, if you don't, go back, watch again. If you're ready to proceed, go ahead and move on. Step three, this is another little chart helping you review the DLCO. Kind of a, probably a little more information than you want to see, but it makes sense. A low DLCO with obstruction is what we talked about, emphysema, remember? Uh, a low DLCO with restriction are going to be all of the interstitial lung diseases here. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. All right, so we're moving on to step four. Step four, we're halfway there, guys, halfway there. Step four, we sometimes, not all, in all cases, but sometimes we want to determine if the process is reversible or not. When this is only on the obstructive side here, okay? So remember we said asthma is a reversible obstruction where COPD is a non-reversible um, uh, obstruction. And so sometimes when we have kind of a muddy water picture, we want to know, is this reversible or not? So what we do for the patient is we do the PFTs regular. We have them do a spirometry. And then we do it again after we administer a bronchodilator. We give them a metered dose inhaler of albuterol or, or some other bronchodilator. And then we repeat the results. And what we should expect to see if it is asthma related is that the FEV1 or FEC should increase by greater than 12% and 200 milliliters. This is very testable. I highly suggest you commit this 12% to memory, okay? Now, if we administer the bronchodilator and we see hardly any change, less than 12%, it is likely irreversible, more like the COPD. All right, so that's the, the post bronchodilator. That is the testing the reversibility of obstruction. Step five is a little different. It's the opposite, right? So let's say we have a patient that has asthma or we think they have asthma, but it only happens when they exercise. When they come in to have their PFTs done, they have normal results because they're not acutely having asthma-like symptoms. They don't have that provoking agent to make them have the symptoms. And so we know they probably have asthma, but the PFTs look normal. So what do we do? In that case, we can elect to do what's called a bronchoprovocation. Remember, provoking is kind of poking at it. You're instigating, right? And bronco is the airway. So you can imagine that we'll give them something to help to induce an asthmatic type reaction. And what we do, we'll usually kind of get to this step, we'll see that everything's normal, and then we'll say, you know what, let's do bronchoprovocation, because they have symptoms that suggest asthma. And so we give them the bronchoprovocation challenge, and it's usually called the methicoline challenge. And this medication causes bronchoconstriction. When we do that in a controlled setting, of course, having the medications ready to go, because we, we're inducing an asthma attack, essentially, uh, we should, if it is asthma, we should see a decrease in the FEV1 by greater than by greater than 20%, okay? So, we should see that the FEV1 decreases by 20%, okay? That's what I mean to say. FEV1 should decrease by 20%, right? Cuz we're we're making things worse. And if it decreases by 20%, then the asthma is likely, okay? Now, if we give the methicoline challenge and there's really no change, then it's probably not due to asthma. And that's the bronchoprovocation challenge. They also, just like they love to test on this number here, they love to test on this here. So make sure you understand it. Step six is to grade the severity of the abnormality. So FEV1 is the predictor of, of severity. And so we will look at the FEV1 and this helps us grade the severity, whether restrictive or uh, or obstructive, usually more obstructive. We will look at the FEV1 
and that will help us determine the severity, okay? So if we have an FEV1 that's greater than 70, mild disease, right? If we have then moving all the way down to less than 35, we have a severe disease or very severe disease. Step seven and eight really require you to use your problem solving skills to put the pieces together to solve the, the diagnosis, to come up with the diagnosis. Uh, step seven is really considering the differential diagnosis. And of course, remember, we have a history with each case that we do. So we're putting the pieces together. We're considering all of these and we're looking. Did it show an obstructive process? Well, these are the things that gen tend to cause the obstructive. And we see restrictive has a lot more cause. Remember, we said restrictive lung disease can be caused by like greater than 180 different things, right? And so we have to put the pieces together here. Another thing we can do at this step in the process is compare what we found today to what we found maybe a year ago or a previous PFT results. And that helps us kind of create an, a whole picture of what's going on with our patient. So here's our algorithm. I've gone step by step. Hopefully you are able to explain starting from here all the way down on the obstructive side and all the way down on the restrictive side. And then the little side track, if it's normal and we want to prove it's asthma, it's not on this chart, but it was that little section here in the middle. All right. So now is the point where we need to apply what we've learned because we'll only know if we truly understood it, if we can do it, if we can apply it. So let's do a quick case together. We have a 60 year old man. He's coming to primary care provider with complaints of increasing dyspnea on exertion. He has a 40 pack year history of smoking. Not good, right? Uh, and he's retired for, from a career building contractor. So we have a couple things in the history here and we're starting to build our differential. The 40 pack year history is definitely leaning more towards like a COPD. But then when we see this building contractor, maybe a restrictive asbestos exposure. Who knows, right? Uh, so let's look at his PFTs. Now, when we get PFTs, the printout that we get is a lot more complicated. There's a lot more values associated, but I want you to get the big picture. So here we have some PFTs, all right? So the next slide, we're gonna go step by step and analyze these PFTs. Alrighty, so we said step one was to examine the FEV1 to FEC ratio. Now let's look down here at our results. We have a 61% for the FEV1 to FEC ratio. So we're gonna look up here and it is definitely less than 70%. And we said it's less than 70%, we are gonna go down the obstructive pathway. So we're thinking this is probably an obstructive process, which kind of starts us thinking maybe COPD, right? They got that smoking history, but we're not quite sure yet. So let's continue. Step two we said was to look at the TLC. Now, the TLC here is 150%. Okay, so 150%, if we look over here at the percent predicted, is indicating hyperinflation. Hyperinflation goes kind of along with COPD, so it's starting to make some sense. Okay, that was step two. Now let's move on to step three. DLCO. We said DLCO tells us on the obstructive side whether it's parenchymal disease or not. And in his case, our DLCO is 98%. Now, if we come to the algorithm, it is definitely greater than 80%. 98% is greater than 80. So if we look down here, we, we say that the disease process looks kind of mild. And it's more than likely chronic bronchitis, although you have to still put the clinical picture together. Next, we're going to determine the reversibility. Now, in this case, they elected to do a bronchodilator test. And when they did that, we only saw a 6% change after the bronchodilator. And that's a 6% change in the FEV1. Now, if we look over here, we had less than 12% change. So it kind of helps reinforce that it's probably not asthma. It's probably more COPD, which is what we were thinking initially, right? Just based on the history. It's kind of showing us objective evidence that we are correct in our working diagnosis. Uh, next step, step five, is a bronchoprovocation test. In this case, it wouldn't be indicated. We don't need to prove uh, whether it is or it isn't asthma because we already kind of did based on the bronchodilator test. So we move on to step six. Let's look at the severity. So we said when we look at severity, we look at the FEV1 
down here. FEV1 in this patient is 25%. Now that is really low, okay? And he actually falls into the very severe category here. So we have a case that is severe, okay? We, we see that there is hyperinflation. It's an obstructive process, more than likely COPD. And if we had to differentiate, probably more chronic bronchitis. And so this is the point where we would work through our differential diagnosis. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear that in this case, we have a COPD -er, okay? So kind of a recap of the case. Normal, abnormal spirometry, definitely abnormal, right? FEV1 to FEC ratio is reduced. We said that's obstructive. Then FVC is only 41% and the FEV1 only 25%. And that's well below the limit of normal 80%. Uh, the FEV1 is only 25% predicted, which would classify him as a very severe airflow obstruction. Uh, he also doesn't meet criteria for reversible airflow obstruction, which is consistent with COPD. Uh, in addition to these things, we would probably expect him to see an elevated residual volume, which shows air trapping. And his TLC is up, which indicates hyperinflation. So does it make sense? Does the PFTs match the clinical picture for you? Do you understand how to work through the algorithm to help you decide on this? Now, this algorithm, you know, you were going step by step here. When you get good at interpreting PFTs, you don't really have to. You kind of just innately see, okay, this is low, that's obstructive. This is high or normal, okay, no big deal. And okay, DLCO is low, okay, it's emphysema, okay? You get good at it. Same thing on the restrictive side. You, know, you notice FEV1 to FEC ratio is greater than 70. Okay, I think it's more restrictive, could be normal. Let's look at the TLC. TLC is low, it's restrictive. And DLCO is low, it's a lung restriction due to lung disease. You get good at it, okay? So you do need to remember some important numbers. Those important numbers are 70% for the FEV1 to FVC ratio, less than 12% or greater than 12% for the bronchodilator, the uh, less than 20% for the bronchoprovocation, which is not on here. You also need to know the TLC, less than 80% for restrictive, and the DLCO, 80%. All right, got it? Hopefully. I suggest that you find some cases. I know in class, uh, we will be doing cases in class together so we can kind of solidify what we've learned today. If you have any questions or things are still not, um, not clicking, feel free to reach out to me via email or put a question up on the discussion board on our Blackboard. Here's some more flow loop volumes. This is kind of what it looks like when we do spirometry. This is the, the X, Expirations is FEV1 forcing air out, and we see this natural curve as air is coming out, 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 and then all of it's out, uh, and then we breathe in. And so these are the changes that we would see with the restriction and obstruction. Uh, and here's a quick recap type chart. So this is the point where I would ask if you have any questions. In this case, you can expect you'll have some questions on your panopto lecture. Take a break if you need to.
All right, so moving on to acid-base interpretation. Now, this is basic, okay? Most of the time, acid-base interpretation is left for the renal module because a lot of acid-base is controlled by the kidneys. But I like to cover it on a very superficial level because it affects the respiratory system as well. This is kind of your 101, your intro to acid-base. And I'm going to try to make it simple. I know it's more complex than this, but we're going to try to get it so that we can get these questions right on my exam. There'll be at least one. Usually there's two, though. So when we look at acid-base imbalances, we get these results from ABGs, okay, from, uh, from arterial blood gases, okay? We need to know the normal values and function, okay? We need to know what is normal, what is a normal acid, what is a normal uh, base, or what are the ranges of that, and then we need to know what the normal pH is. We also need to know which values are affected by which functioning. So what does the respiratory system control and what does the metabolic system control? And then we need to interpret the labs, okay? And there's three quick, easy steps to do that. We're going to keep it simple. So what are the normal values? Let's look at pH first. pH. So normal pH in our blood is 7.35 to 7.45. And in most exams, like the pants and my exam, I will give you these normal values, okay? I will give you the normal value for pH. I will give you the normal value for CO2, and I will give it to you for bicarb. I will give you the normal values, but they're pretty easy to remember. Normal is 7.35 to 7.45. This is where we live. This is normal. Now, if we have less than 7.35, less than this normal, this lower limit of normal, that is acidotic. That is acidosis. Okay. Low pH, acidotic. If it's greater than 7.45, we have a high pH or alkalosis. Okay. That's very important. You got to understand this before we move on. Got it? Good. Next, let's look at the CO2. CO2 is also carbonic acid. Uh, it's CO, the CO2 we think of, of us blowing off out of our lungs. Okay. Normal range, which is really easy to remember, is 35 to 45, which kind of matches up with the pH, right? So 7.35 and 35, and 7.45, and 45. So it's easy to remember. CO2 is acidic. So the more CO2 you have, the more acidic you will be. The less CO2 you have, the more alkalotic you'll be, okay? And this CO2 is controlled by the lungs. It's the CO2 we breathe off every time we, every time we exhale, okay? Uh, if we breathe faster and deeper, we will blow off more CO2. Like when we hyperventilate, <laughs> we're breathing off more CO2. And when we breathe off more CO2, we decrease the acid in our body, which lowers the CO2, which is more alkalotic. Got it? When we don't breathe or when we breathe slowly, it builds up CO2 in our system. And increased CO2 increases the acid and it's more acidotic. And like I said, you can remember pH and CO2 pretty easily, the normal values, because of the 35 to 45 thing. All right? Hopefully we got that. CO2, acid. Next, we're going to talk about bicarbonate or bicarb, HCO3. The normal range for bicarb is 22 to 26. And increased bicarb, high bicarb is basic or alkalotic. It's an alkaline, okay? And it's regulated by the kidneys. It's a metabolic thing. The kidneys regulate bicarb. So it's kind of a check and balance system. The, the lungs are responsible for the acids and CO2 and the, lung, and the metabolic system responsible for bicarb and the basics. Okay? They work together. Uh, whereas we can speed up and slow down our breathing pretty easily, it takes a long time for, for the metabolic system to compensate. Okay, so it is slow. It takes about 12 to 24 hours to compensate and change levels. Like we said before, the more bicarb we have, the more alkalotic we are. The less bicarb we have, the more acidotic we are. Hopefully we got this. If you don't understand this, take time to learn it because moving on is going to get a lot more tricky. Okay, let's interpret. Let's take these results. So step one, let's look at our pH. Is our pH normal? Is it low or acidotic? If it is low, we will draw a little arrow down, okay? If it is high, greater than 7.5, it's more alkalotic, and we'll 
write a little arrow up. And what I recommend doing when you have a test question is right away, write down whether it is acidosis or alkalosis. So in this case, let me get my little pen out. If we have a pH that let's say is 7.25, we are going to say that it is less than the range. It is acidotic. It, we'll write our little arrow down and I will write down acidosis. And now we have a 50-50 shot of getting it, right? I, I didn't spell it right, but dosis. It's either going to be respiratory acidosis or metabolic acidosis. We got it, okay? So I write that down on a multiple choice question. I would cross out the two alkalosis answers. Usually you have A, B, C, D, right? Now, if we saw that the pH is, say, 7.50, we would say that that is alkalotic. We put our arrow up and we would write alkalosis. All right, we got that? Hopefully so. I think this is the easiest part. So let's move on. Next, we're gonna evaluate the CO2, okay? CO2, we said, is controlled by the lungs and the normal range is gonna be from 35 to 45. So if we have a CO2 that is less than 35, that is actually more basic, right? Less acid is more basic. Hopefully we understand that. So we would draw a down arrow, okay? If we have a, a CO2 that is greater than 45, we would draw an up arrow, okay? And what we're essentially gonna do is compare these arrows to these arrows, okay? And that what that will do is help us determine what it is. There is a really quick and easy uh, way to determine it. It's called the Rome, how we approach it. And what Rome means is respiratory is opposite. So that's what it says here. If it's opposite, it's respiratory. If it's going the same direction, we need to move on to step three, which will help determine if it is metabolic. So step three, we should say that HCO3 should be going in the same direction as the arrow from the pH. And that means that it's due to the kidneys, metabolic. Okay. So I know it might be a little tricky. It's hard to know if you understand it without trying it. So I have a practice problem that we'll go through. And I also have placed on your blackboard multiple practice problems to go through so that you can know whether you understand it or not. And what I'll do here, let me see if I can erase. Uh, I guess you have to erase it all, but uh, we'll just continue. Here's a quick recap. Okay, so this is what it means if it's opposite. So this arrow is going down, this arrow is going up. That's opposite, so it, it is a respiratory problem. If they're going in the same direction, which is these two going the same direction, it is metabolic. So respiratory, opposite, metabolic, the same. Okay, equal or the same. So that's, how, that's the easy way to interpret acid base. Now we know that the system, our homeostasis, tries to compensate for each other. So in some occasions, it won't always be this simple. Okay, it won't always be this simple. Sometimes we'll get compensation by bicarb here, and there will be another arrow. So if we have respiratory acidosis, our pH is down. It's due to the lungs, so our PCO2 is up. How would we think that the kidneys would try to compensate for this? Do we want the kidneys to be to create a more acidic envir environment and contribute to the problem or create a more basic problem and help the problem? Well, we want to try to create a better situation for us. So we want to increase the alkaline. We want to increase the base to try to compensate for the acid. So in this case, HCO3 is basic. We would increase this we would increase the bicarb to help compensate. But remember that takes 12 to 24 hours. So it'll take a while before our kidneys can make up for it, okay? In this case, respiratory alkalosis, we have an increased pH, okay? So we have a pH that's high. So it's high alkaline, it's basic. And if it's caused by the lungs, then our PCO2 is gonna be down, right? Because this is 
acid, and when you have the acid going down, when it's below the normal range, it's more alkalotic. So what would the kidneys do to try to compensate for this? It's an alkalosis. This is also alkalotic, so we're gonna wanna, in, we're gonna wanna decrease the bicarb. That would be the compensation that would happen, okay? And we won't know if it is truly, completely compensated until the pH reaches a normal level. Understand? Good. And we can apply the same things to metabolic acidosis and alkalosis by the way that the lungs react. So if we have a metabolic acidosis, we have a low pH, and it's caused by something metabolic, so it's not caused by the lungs. So we have a low, bi a low bicarb because it's acidotic, and this is basic, so we have a low base, which makes it acidotic. And so how would our lungs try to compensate for a metabolic acidosis? Well, we don't want to increase PaCO2 because that would make this more acidic, so we actually decrease. And we do this by breathing off CO2 by hyperventilating. And last but not least, metabolic alkalosis. We have a, we have a basic pH, and it's caused by increased bicarb. And so our lungs will try to increase the PaCO2 to increase that so that we can so that we can compensate for the basic state. And we do this by slowing our breathing. All right, hopefully we got it. Moving on. We're gonna do a quick look at uh, the different processes. So respiratory acidosis, uh, what kind of breathing causes a building of CO2? It would be slow breathing, slow or not breathing. So we're not able to blow off CO2. Okay, and when we're not able to blow off CO2, we have increased acidosis, okay? So pH will be down, CO2 will be up, and normal in early and up in compensation. And here's a quick uh, diagram or picture of what it, that would look like and what causes it. Respiratory alkalosis is uh, blowing off too much CO2, so hyperventilation is what I think of. And that can be due to COPD, it can be due to anxiety, it can be due to mechanical ventilation, we're breathing too fast for, for folks. The pH will be up, the CO2 will be down, and we see this compensation. Okay. Metabolic acidosis, we won't talk about much here, but we will talk about it in the renal module. Metabolic acidosis is going to be down, down, down. So the pH is down because it's acidotic. The CO2 is down because it's compensating. And the HCO3 is down because that's what's causing the acidosis. Hopefully we got it. When we think of metabolic acidosis, I always think of the uh, anion gap versus non-ion gap, which we'll cover in renal. And I think of the mnemonic mud piles cat. And these are the things that cause anion gap metabolic acidosis. One good example here that we learned earlier is DKA. So patients that are in DKA tend to have metabolic acidosis. And when you have metabolic acidosis, we said we want the CO2 to go down. And when we want the CO2 to go down, we have to breathe faster to blow it off. And so that's why we get this Kuzmal breathing or hyperventilation because we're trying to blow off CO2 to help become more alkalotic. Got it? Hopefully. Last but not least, metabolic acidosis. Uh, think up, up, up on this one. Uh, this one, the pH is going to be up because we're alkaline. CO2 is going to compensate by going up. Where we kind of breathe slower. And then HCO3 is also going to be up because that's what's causing the alkal alkalosis. Okay. Hopefully we got it. Let's do some practice, okay? So we have our patient. Our patient has a pH of 7.28, a, a CO2 of 55, and an HCO3 of 23. We said step one was to look at normals. Here's our normal values. Just in case you can't remember them, they will be on the test for you. Okay, That's the first thing we want to look at. Some folks, I, I don't, but some folks like to draw out kind of this little checkerboard here to help them figure it out. I don't use a checkerboard. I kind of just use arrows and, and 
my brain. But if this helps you, at least for starters, to help understand, use the checkerboard, okay? So we said after we look at our normal values, the first thing we're going to do is look at the pH. Now, is this pH high or low compared to normal? Well, lower limit of normal is 7.35, and this is 7.28. So this is low, and we said low pH equals acid. So if we were taking our test, I would recommend you go ahead and write acidosis, right? And when you write acidosis, you're going to cross out everything on your list that has alkalosis in it because we can definitely rule those out. Now we got a 50-50 shot at getting it right, okay? We said after we do the pH, we're going to look at the CO2. And in this case, we have a CO2 of 55. Is 55 high or low? We look over here. It's definitely above 45, so it is high, right? We said this was low, and we're saying this is high. Okay, so over here on our little chart, we would write high. Now, we could stop there according to the way we did because this is low, and this is high. And we have opposite, right? We said opposite. And when we said respiratory, was opposite. So we could stop there. I don't like to stop there. I like to look at the whole picture. But we could already say that this is a respiratory acidosis. Okay, let's just move on and look at the bicarb. We'll look at the bicarb is 23. That actually falls in the normal range, right? So that's normal. So we could write normal here. Now, if the bicarb was trying to compensate for this acidosis, which way do you think that it would trend towards? Would it go up or down? What do you think? Well, bicarb is more alkalotic. We have an acidotic state. So in that case, it would try to go up. We would try to be more alkalotic by raising. The kidneys are going to try to hold on to the bicarb to try to compensate. In this case, though, it's normal. Okay. All right. So does that help? Hopefully it does. We have a respiratory opposite, which equals respiratory acidosis, which is what we thought already. We had figured that out. So what do we think? Not too bad? Hopefully not. Hopefully we got it. The only way you're going to know if you got it is doing practice cases. So I recommend you doing some practice cases, and I have some for you. If you look on your blackboard, you go under the restrictive lung disease PFTs acid base, and you look under the acid base study guide, you will see this acid base cases for the student PDF. It's a worksheet and it has lots of acid base cases, some of which are easy, like the one we just did, and some of which are more complicated. And so I would recommend if you really want to know whether you know your stuff, do these cases and do them with a group. If you do them with a group, you'll have someone there to help you figure it out and to kind of bounce ideas off of that. I would recommend as your homework.
we've reached the end of this 47 minute lecture a little longer than I anticipate but you can always speed me up I tend to go kind of slow give you time to think these are some of the references I used hopefully we've got the basics so that we can do these problems if you can get these right you'll get at least two questions right on my test probably more I tend to have at least one to two PFT and one to two acid base questions on my test and I guarantee you will have at least one on your pants. So this is money in the bank. Make sure you know how to do this. If you have questions, reach out to a friend, go to tutoring, or reach out to me. Thank you. See you in class.